Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. This is a good friend of mine as of many years now that we've known each other. We will describe that uh, our, our relationship here in the interview as we uh, get going here. But before we get started, I just want to give a quick background to the individual that we have on today, our special guest. Um, his name is Mudar Zaran. He is the Secretary General of the Jordanian op Opposition, described as the leader of the Palestinian majority in Jordan and a veteran of the U.S. Department of State staff member. That's just a little bit, a little bit of his background and what he has been doing for these many years now. And uh, Mudar, um, I know you and you know me, but why don't you give a quick, short summary of yourself to our audience? Who are you? You know, where'd you grow up? That kind of thing. Okay, I'm a Jordanian of Palestinian heritage. Uh, so I'm a proud Jordanian uh, to both Jordanian parents who are from Palestinian heritage. Uh, they were born around uh, on the outskirts of uh, Jerusalem uh, before the uh, before the 1960s. My dad was born in 1948 around the time of the war, and my uh, mother, I think five, seven, maybe ten years later, in uh, the Neshtachim of the West Bank in Bethlehem. That said, um, uh, our family is situated in uh, Jordan, our country, and we've been fighting the fight for uh, human rights in uh, Jordan, civil rights in Jordan for women, minorities, freedom of religion, and also for a more civil and secular state with a Muslim identity, and at the same time, establishing the national identity of Jordan as actually uh, for what really Jordan is really is, uh, the 78% of historical British Mandate Palestine. Uh, we are seeking to build a nation state which will secure uh, freedom to the citizens and end the apartheid state, uh, which is apartheid regime in Jordan, where the majority Jordanians are are discriminated against, and where they are being um, evaluated in a, a they with a score, believe it or not, with a point system. So your your citizenship, your national entitlements are connected to a point system where they calculate who's your father, who's your grandfather, where did you grow up, and so forth, in a very, uh, in a regime very similar to North Korea's quote-unquote Song Bon regime, which is exactly a point system. Jordan is one of the uh, most uh, ridiculously um, identified kingdoms, uh, kingdom where a foreign family of no more than 50 individuals. You know, if you count, if you count out the, the wives and the in-laws they married to, they, they, they're down to 50 individuals controlling a majority of um, Jordanians, of which uh, more than 90%, more than 90%, I repeat, are of Palestinian heritage. This wow. has contributed to the ongoing conflict with the Israelis, and the ongoing uh, uh, very unfortunate situation in more ways than another, which we will be discussing uh, today. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Jordan controls and fuels a lot of, a lot of the uh, energy hubs, so fuel hubs, for, for the conflict. The first is the issue of Jerusalem. The royal Hashemite family controls the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque slash Temple Mount. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure why is that, because they don't belong there. They occupied uh, Eastern Jerusalem in 1948. Uh, they had no right to control Al-Aqsa Mosque. They still have no right to keep the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, it's not right, and they fuel... I can only quote the Israeli government in a 2015 statement uh, when there was a lot of trouble on the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa Mosque. A statement by the Israeli government, which you can definitely look up on Google, 
Israeli government said that the Jordanian government is involved in incitement and action, quote unquote, incitement and action tr- contributing to the unrest of the Temple Mount slash Al Aqsa. They mm-hmm. also control the Hashemite royal family, controls uh, uh, the uh, freedom of worship on the Temple Mount. We need to be clear about it. And my position as Jordan's next leader, make no mistake about that, is uh, about the freedom of worship on Al Aqsa, on the Temple Mount. From an Islamic, and I'm a proud Muslim, from an Islamic point of view, you cannot, you cannot, according to the Quran, prevent anyone from exercising the right of worship. And uh, from the Hadith point of view, the book of the Hadith, uh, Muhammad, our prophet, allowed the uh, Christians of Arabia to perform the prayers inside his mosque, which is Islam's second most holy site. So we don't have the right to prevent Jews from praying on the Temple Mount. This is a quick question. Quick question here, Muda. Sorry to cut you off. Um, You're now telling me as a Muslim, you're now explaining to the audience. I mean, first of all, so you are for sure a a devout Muslim. I know that. I know that because when we first met, uh, we actually roomed together, right? So back in 2012, I think it was, we were on a special uh, um, mission uh, to connect all kinds of uh, different people in social media, in, uh, in, in political affairs, what have you. And that's where actually Muda and I met here in Israel. And, um, you know, you surprised me, you know, because I was like, this guy, I mean, like he's a legit Muslim, devout, and to hear your views about Israel, to hear your views about Jordan and so on, first of all, it was eye-opening for me because I did not know all the things that you were actually uh, telling the group. And and, and in large, also, you ended up uh, being interviewed by the Israeli uh, media and so on, and you were able to really get that voice out that we rarely get to hear here as Israelis. So all that to say that what you're saying, this is not you're not a Israeli Mossad uh, uh, plant or, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of like conspiracy theorists out there when they hear Muslims like you speaking and speaking on Israel in a positive light, obviously you're not going to say everything about Israel is peachy and great, <laughs> you know, but you're very objective about your views. You're very frank about your views, in my opinion. And it's going to be, I think, very jarring for some of the the the, the people around the world hearing the from the river to the sea, pa- let, let Palestine be free, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, there's all these rioters, there's all these supporters of Palestine, but okay. everything you just mentioned right now, right? There's a few little words there, a few little statements I'm I'm understanding, but the the audience isn't probably getting it. Um, so so first of all, I just want to throw that out. Okay, this is our relationship. We've known each other since 2012, and like I said, I can clearly uh, testify for Mudad himself that I know that he is definitely a devout Muslim and so on. That's why he's on the show. And you're from Jordan and your family roots are in Israel. Your family roots are pre in pre 1948. We're here in Israel and you were part of the Arabs that left and fled in 48 and your family fled to Jordan and so on. Correct. So, I mean, this is just, Right. So this is your connection to Israel. This is not somebody living abroad. Your English is really good, just like my English is really good and, and, and not your typical Middle Eastern accented. But but uh, this is legit. You're from this area. And I've even seen streets in Jordan by your family name. So your roots well, are definitely there's, connected. There's, right. <laughs> the, the, the most affluent neighborhood in uh, Amman, the capital. Is Zahran neighborhood. It's a uh, thirteen thousand donums, uh, uh, thirteen thousand donums, a huge area, and uh, it's named after my family. The Zahran Palace. There's the Zahran Palace. There's also the Zahran Street. So, um, I, if I am to stick to the script, I should have enjoyed the family's wealth and not gone against uh, the system, not rock the boat. Hmm. Because I had it. Growing up, I had everything everyone else would 
possibly spend their lifetime trying to achieve. I was born with it, born to it. And in fact, my uh, work has res- over the past almost 20 years now has resulted in the family losing most of their net worth. I'm talking most, like up to 95% of it. So it's been very, very expensive. And you can add to it that I don't make a buck me doing what I'm doing. Some people get finance. Some people charge for interviews. Some people charge for speeches. I know this, you know, least known Arab Israeli journalist. Yeah. And he's not, he doesn't tell people anything they don't know, only that he's an Arab and claims to be claims to be pro Israel. And uh, he makes up to twenty five thousand dollars per speech. <laughs> I I never charged a dollar. And, and in fact, when I went to Sweden to do all those speeches, I ended up incurring a lot of the expense of the trip. So yeah. I'm doing this. I don't need to prove anything to anyone. I don't care what people say. And we'll move forward. Bottom line is yeah. fact remain facts. Mm-hmm. And by the way, by the way, talking about Sweden. So this is something that we actually helped. You know, I helped you back in the day because we were living in Sweden. I'm remembering this now. And I remember like, you know, trying to help get you with uh, uh, your your travel expenses covered and so on. And by the way, um, I made sure as well that, that Mudana had uh, uh, like Secret Service style protection throughout his whole time. We because have, we had... Yeah, because because he's a, he's he's it's important the audience understands what he's going to tell you is the kind of things that get you with a target on your back from fellow extremist Muslims who don't like the truth to get out, and, and also so, f- also from <laughs> from the establishment, the extremist Muslims and the are, yeah are yeah. part of the establishment. Yeah. The extremist so, Muslims yeah. are the are the. I'm sorry to interrupt here. Yeah. But the extremist Islamists are the sweetheart of the uh, globalist establishment. Mm. They are one of the most successful tools which have been deployed by the globalist evil establishment, which which feeds on conflict. Yeah. Now that's why those um, you know. Uh, Many of those extremists are, are flooding the shores of Europe at the moment that the floodgates are open. It's mm. all a part of, you know, divide and conquer, create crisis and manage it. Yeah. This is why the Islamists, if you follow the track record and we need to put the set the record straight, the Islamists, when they were established, tolerated, propped up, by several Western administrations. And the, the champions of that were the Bush administration, which claimed to be fighting against Islamists post 9-11, when in reality what he did was fight any of the enemies of Islamists, like Toplin, Saddam Hussein, and so forth. So mm-hmm. no, none of this is by coincidence. And the fact yeah. that the Islamist radicals are taking over Europe by storm, and they being issued residency cards, welfare, you name it. None of this is by coincidence. We have to call things by their own name. There yeah. are people within the Western establishment who are very supportive of Islamists in order to achieve control over the masses and actually get their own way because it's pretty much like terrorizing an entire neighborhood with a vicious pit bull or the boogeyman. Mm. And you control the pit bull. So what better? At the same yeah. time, yes, I remember. I appreciate your help when we went to Sweden, and uh, the other gentleman, uh, my my our other friend, if you remember him. And yeah. Yes, we we received then full arm um, protection from the Swedish intelligence, and uh, you know, and internal intelligence, and the armored vehicles. You were they were very helpful. The kingdom of Sweden was very very generous in receiving me and uh, back to the basics yeah. when we talk arab israeli conflict anyone with half a brain should realize by now but that the conflict has is is not actually between the arabs and the jews or the palestinians and the jews the conflict mm-hmm. is in reality a, a a a controlled conflict proxy war there are many similar proxy wars. If they 
they, quote unquote, could launch a war between one country, North Korea and South Korea. How many people got killed? All a proxy war. We have been a proxy war for the past uh, almost a, de- a century. The Who's the we? Who's the we? The Palestinian, we. Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian Jews. Jews no. and Palestinians, so-called Palestinians and so-called Jews, because we are citizens of the same holy land. Mm-hmm. We need to set the record straight. Do Jews have a connection to the land? Absolutely. You cannot deny their connection to the land. Hmm. Do Arabs have connection to the land? First of all, most of the so-called Arabs in Palestine slash Israel, whatever you wish to call it, are not Arabs. Most of us, most of us. Hmm. And DNA studies prove that. Most of us hold Jewish DNA. Kohanim, Jew DNA is the most dominant within Palestinian Arabs. The hmm. ones who are immigrants, non-Arab, non-Palestinians, non-Jews, were mostly in the major cities. They, those are the ones reported by Robert Kennedy in the old days. They were immigrating to Palestine because Palestine was flourishing because of the Jewish immigration. Jews brought work, brought cars, brought technology, brought the first electric, electricity power company to yeah. Nahari, in Naharim, which was joined with Jordan at the time. Mm-hmm. So this was a very prosperous country and people wanted to immigrate, but the immigration remained limited. Because the Arab immigrants came to the major cities, which were Yaffa, uh, Shechem, uh, Gaza, and to an extent, very slim extent to Jerusalem. Most of the Palestinians are villages, Falachim, the plural sound for Falach, which means peasant, like my family. We're yeah. family peasants. We are yeah. originally from a village called Tal Hazora, which is opposite to Bet Shemesh. Tal Hazura, Beit Shemesh, and eight collective villages around it, eight villages, they were Jews 150 years ago. You go to my to my grandfather's house, you know, when I think the Stern, Stern gang, when, when we left, you know, I mean, in the middle of 1948, uh, my grandfather had the largest house, he was the Mukhtar the chieftain of the village, and he had the largest house in the village, in Tal Hazura. Mm. So the Stern gang, because they, they took over the place and they couldn't they couldn't basically keep it. They didn't know if they can keep it. It was a vantage point. So they decided that they need to blow it up because they didn't want the Arabs to take it over and basically use it against them. So they blew up the whole place except for one piece of it. Do you know which piece? Nah. It was an engraved in, 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 mosaic of the Lion of Judah. Why would a so-called Arab and a Muslim have the Lion of Judah in his house? You name it. The signs of Palestinians being the lost tribe is all over the place. But let's not be too, too happy about it because the Palestinians don't want to acknowledge it. The Palestinians mm-hmm. don't want to recognize that they are actually Jews And they were forced to convert. I am Muslim. I believe in Islam. I believe in my prophet, Muhammad. I don't agree with the Hadith, the book of the Hadith, because a lot of it was written 200 years after Muhammad's death. What's the Hadith? What is that? To the audience that doesn't uh, know. After the Quran. Uh, The Quran was, according to what we believe, was dictated by God. Now, the book of the Hadith is, the Quran is barely 500 pages. The book of the Hadith is half a million plus pages narrated wow. by men at 250 years after Muhammad's death. And the book claims those were with the words of Prophet Muhammad. The book of the Hadith, some of it, some up to 5 to 10 percent is very good regarding, you know, respect thy parents, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Much pretty much the Ten Commandments, which is good. Then mm. we have other stuff. We have the uh, crazy Nazi stuff, the throwing stones. You know, you know. By the end of time, quote unquote, we're going to be fighting the Jews. Them west to the river, which is Palestine slash Israel. Israel today's Israel, and we east to the river Jordan slash whatever. If you wish to call it Jordan today, you know, they don't mention those names, of course. But it says east to the river, west to the river. 
and we're going to chase the Jews where they're going to hide behind trees, and the trees are going to call the names, telling us, he's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. His stones are going to tell us, he's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. And then except for, quote, unquote, gharkad, a certain kind of trees, which is a Jewish tree, which will not tell about them. Do you believe, as anyone with wow. half a brain would accept that, not to mention that the book oh. of Hadith speaks about black dogs being uh, being the devil. And, well, Hamas, uh, Hamas believes that, and that's part of what inspired a lot of these um, inhum, inhuman, I don't call it even animalistic, because animals don't act the way these men acted on October 7th. And uh, I can only imagine that the only thing that fueled these men's uh, uh, minds is being brought up with this kind of teaching, but in a brainwashing extremist environment that makes you act inhuman. It's not even a human act, right? But there's also hadiths, I think, that are also uh, in a positive too, uh, which contradict that and says that, and this I've learned from another fellow Muslim friend of mine here, uh, a Bedouin actually, who told me that, uh, that, that the Quran, I think he said, or the hadith, I'm not sure, says that there's going to be a there's a prophecy that jews will be re returning to the land and that we muslims need to help them in their return which apparently contradicts what you just uh, uh mentioned there right well um if you want to go by the quran uh, the quran gives a very and again i'm you know i'm an academic so mm -hmm. i would be very careful when i make statements about a subject i'm not specialized that but since you know we want to give the uh, audience their share of entertainment. <laughs> the Quran says that by the end of time that the Jews have been oppressed, kicked out of their land. By by the end of time, they would God would give them another chance. He would give them money. He would give them male children, which you can see, you know, walking through the streets of Jerusalem, you see those young Israeli soldiers. So he did actually give him that, and then they're going to be tested. Mm -hmm. If they do well, if they follow the teachings of God, if they don't oppress, if they don't steal, if they don't hurt somebody, if they don't commit adultery, if they, if they go straight, God is going to bless them. And if they don't behave and follow the line, according to the Quran, they're going to be taught a lesson like never before. So this is as far as the Islamic dogma goes, but mm. let's not, you know, sink into that category. We need to talk about today. Let's sure. start. You wish, and you know, it's you're making a lot of time being here. I'm making a lot of time, a lot of you know, sacrifice being making the time. You know, my schedule is usually tight, and so is yours. And mm. our audience deserves to learn something. Rafa, should we start with Rafa? All eyes on Rafa. That's the new slogan, yeah. apparently, right? Okay. So Rafa, might as well. Rafa, and you know, I have my sources which I cannot reveal. And uh, I've been, you know, there has been countless examples of when I was right. A recent example is two years and a half ago, I made the tweet about the Iranian president telling him to basically behave or watch out. And I told him that you might expect fire in the sky. The tweet is still there. It's two years and a half old. And I Crazy. think it manifested itself to be true. This is not, you know, fortune telling. <laughs> this is not, I'm not a clairvoyant, but trust me. Let's no. just say I have got the right connections. Rafa, <laughs> the reason the reason both uh, the kingdom uh, occupation, the Hashemite occupation of Jordan slash kingdom of Jordan and, uh, the, uh, and Egypt, the reason they have been adamant for four months now that Israel should never go into Rafa is they have a lot to hide. Mm. The tunnels with the, um, Egypt has been actually a, a very, very strong trade. And right on the first day of the attack, I was interviewed and I said that Egypt, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and another Arab Gulf state were involved. I, I won't say which Arab Gulf state, but it's not Qatar. It's not the usual suspect. And now what's happening, how adamant Rafa is, uh, how adamant Egypt and Jordan are about not Israel not uh, conquering Rafa or breaking into Rafa, uh, it shows that they have something to hide, and indeed they do. And a lot of this is going to come out eventually. 
Uh, as we stand, the Israelis control 60% of Rafa. They control the Philadelphia crossing, which is Rafa, Rafa's border with Egypt. Uh, there's still 40%, an estimated uh, 1,800 Hamas fighters left. Uh, the reason the Israelis are taking it slow is because it would cost them a lot of soldiers. They can move in today, but it will cost them a lot of soldiers. So the, the way they're doing it is they're making them bleed to death, starving the terrorists to death for, with the, you know no access to ammunition, no access to water, food. And what have you, uh, and what not, you know. Uh, uh, what about the civilians? Because what you just said there, uh, this uh, is the uh, biggest accusation that I'm facing all the time. And uh, again, the if, civilian, if, the if, civilians, if you're not, for the audience who's not used to seeing or hearing me, let's say this is the first time you're exposed to my uh, podcast or me, I'm actively operating in Gaza with my unit. And I've had to combat a lot of these lies against the IDF. And literally since the first day of the war and on October 7th, my unit was called up. We're in a special forces unit and we've been everywhere, everywhere where the military has been operating. And there's been so many lies ongoing. And this is one of them, right? Is that, that we, the IDF or Israel, the government is starving the Palestinians in Gaza. And you just pointed out to the fact that, yeah, that is happening to the terrorists. But can you explain and, and just kind of clarify that what what you under what at least what you know on that? I know what I know on it, but okay, you tell. I know I know yeah. what I know. So I'm, but the problem is I'm not sure how much I can disclose. But I'll tell you this as much as I could. Yeah. Um. Uh, the terrorists are in the tunnels. They need to come out for food and fuel. Yeah. And the Israeli army using depending on unprecedented number of drones. Reconnaissance drones are observing every move and every head that pops up out of the tunnels. Hmm. As for the civilians, the civilians, uh, up to ninety percent of them now. There was one point at one point, there was one point six million in Rafa. Now they are down to a hundred and eighty to two hundred thousand. And uh, with the ones who left to the north. Uh, Israelis are using a, a, a lot of checkpoints to see who they are. In addition to face recognition technology, some of them deployed with drones. So a lot of Hamas fighters, they, they've learned that they cannot hide with the crowds when they move around because they will get caught. Not to mention that the Gazan population is very hostile to Hamas. Hmm. Uh, really? Again, really? Very hostile to Hamas. That's not what the world is saying. The world can go to hell because the so-called <laughs> the so-called experts, yeah, uh, we, uh, you know, look at what they're saying about Israel. Is any yeah. of it true? Yeah, and Tucker the, the Carlson is claiming that we're targeting guys, Christians, right? The same, yeah, the same guys. That's that's, uh, that's a big name. That's a big name right now, right? I mean, yeah, Tucker yeah, Carlson, yeah, yeah. right? And is that is that true at all? Like, do you think the IDF, even, and this is the point I've made. Is do you really think that we can distinguish between a Muslim and a Christian when the Christians in the in the small percentage who are in Gaza most likely are going to dress like Muslims so they don't get persecuted more? Am I wrong by saying that? It's it's very hard to distinguish. They they dress Thank the you. same. And I listen. I Thank am you. not exactly entertained. So you're confirming what I've told people for yeah, months yeah. now. <laughs> I'm, I'm for these stupid exactly, clips. I'm not exactly entertained by. Uh, uh, so-called Western experts because they don't yeah. they know nothing and I can never talk about my work the nature of my work with the Amer with the American government when I was working for them but all I can tell you is at that particular place where I used to work the so-called experts were viewed as a joke because they didn't know anything wow and, by, like we, by we the, would the never read their reports we would never you know would usually laugh the big names in the field. Some mm. of them, you know, big names. Some of them, even Jewish American names. Do mm. you like when we hear them? Like, who is this? Who's this guy? Yeah. Who the hell is this guy? They didn't so, know so, anything. They're situated so, somewhere in Philadelphia, somewhere <laughs> in Washington D.C., or at best somewhere in London, telling us what's going on in Gaza. How do you know? And yeah. th now, th let's not waste a lot of time on it. We need to get back to what's happening in Rafa. So those Rafa. that you were saying were making fun of, in other words, you, you're talking about the department you were with were basically Middle Easterner people.
people from the Middle East, right, who were like yourself, who come from those areas where the United States is operating in or what have you, and you were the ones, the locals from those areas that were making fun of the stateside classic American who didn't grow up in the Middle East, didn't grow up in the countries that that where you're helping them with Intel, and you're making fun of those guys. Is, is Just to be clear for the audience so they understand okay, to be clear, the context. To be clear, within the circles of decision makers, an apparatus of well-informed people in Washington, D.C., none of the so-called experts is taken seriously. Wow. So not only Middle East are not taking it seriously, when they say, oh, and so think tank and research, nobody takes that that Noshkite seriously. It's, it's nonsense. Hmm. It's nonsense. And uh, this current situation in Gaza is a living example of how little do they know. Mm-hmm. It's easy for them to buff a look important and say understandable, you know, fluid statements to make yeah. themselves look important and appear in Fox News. Mm-hmm. So I don't pay, don't consume any time listening to those people. They don't call the shots. They don't know Jack. Yeah. Got Rafa. The they the uh, people moving out of Rafa, the majority has moved up to 85 to actually 90 percent have moved, almost 90 percent. We have less than 200,000 left. The ones cornered inside the tunnels, like rats, are the Hamas terrorists. The ones on on the on the surface are receiving food from the following parties. They're receiving food from for, foreign aid provided mainly through the Americans and the Israeli and the IDF are facilitating it. They're not making anyone starve. I can authoritatively confirm there has been a shortage of food in Rafa at the moment because the, the, the businessmen, because, you know, people who facilitate the food are salesmen, people, you know, retailers. The yeah. retailers have left Rafa for free for themselves. There's more people leaving Rafa. Now, this number has settled down because in the 40% area of Rafa, where people, you know, their own homes, they don't want to leave a flat to live in a tent somewhere. Most people, the 180,000 percent, 180,000 people have moved, ironically, to the shores of the ocean. They are, sorry, to the shores, to the to the sea, to the sea yeah, shores. Yeah, yeah. So that I think you've probably seen them. They're exactly yep. the seashore. This is their way of telling the Israelis we're not a threat because in the mm-hmm. seashores, they're not exactly a threat to the IDF. So right. Hamas is left, you know, is left in a very, very, very different corner. The only problem, and I, you know, again, I've got my well informed sources for this, first yeah. hand, hands on sources. Uh, they can move and finish them off tomorrow. The problem is it will cost Israel. A good number of soldiers, dozens of soldiers, not more, not more necessary. Yeah. There's already been a lot of a lot of dead bodies given by the IDF, and a lot of Israeli families lost their children fighting in Gaza. So uh, it's enough, it's enough. And now they, let's they will squeeze them to death. My estimate, and this is again just an estimate, Rafa will be finished within the span, but you know midsummer Rafa will definitely no later than that. Rafa mm-hmm. will be will be finished. And that's very bad news to a lot of people who are involved with Rafa, uh, involved with Hamas, and uh, a lot of a lot of names would mesmerize you. Wow. Now, what, what does this mean for uh, for us? You know, as uh, we need to again be keep people informed. That's what you're doing, and I appreciate that. Uh, the majority of Palestinians, the majority of Palestinian supports Hamas. Let me repeat, support Hamas. Mm -hmm. The Gazans hate Hamas with a passion because they've they've tried uh, being ruled, you know, they got their wish of an Islamic rulership and they've been mistreated by Hamas. And uh, this is why I'm not even a bit surprised uh, by the uh, claims of Hamas raping Israeli women because Hamas soldiers never never spared Palestinian women. You think they wow. can spare Israeli women? You so know, they're they, doing they're doing that to their own people. Yeah, they were very famous for sexually harassment and sexually violating Palestinian women, 
um, uh, Hamas, they would easily, you know, sexually rape a girl, you know, in the name. Hamas commanders would have plenty of girlfriends. Uh, I can authoritatively say that. One of them, and I, I do want to be controversial by saying mm-hmm. his name, one of them was a spokesperson. And he turned out to be connected to, you know, a lot of uh, whorehouses in uh, in Gaza and elsewhere. And uh, there, so those there, are, there are prostitution houses in Gaza? Uh, run by Hamas. And my Gaza what? friends... Yes. My Gaza but this, friends, this, this contradicts... Gaza. This that contradicts was, this utopian Islamic world that they are so-called oh, preaching to the world. Utopian. It wasn't utopian. It wasn't utopian man. at all. It was hell. The, oh, uh, the, the Hamas people, the Hamas people, um, they were running a regime. It's like pretty much like the Soviet era leaders. They would live in luxury, drive Rolls Royces in, <laughs> right in, in, in plain sight. While yeah. they keep everyone living in uh, under you know Soviet communist rule, um, mm-hmm. it's it's not a surprise. This is uh, pretty much applies uh, to, <laughs> to 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 those kind of people. Uh, wow. Gaza, which Gaza has always been one of the most prosperous cities in the Holy Land. Gaza's ancient. Gaza was uh, there. There are Roman coins printed with the word Gaza on them. So Gaza has always been a prosperous sea hub, seaport. Mm-hmm. And the, Gaza has never known two things. There was never prostitution in Gaza. There was never hunger or poverty in Gaza. Never. Historically. Thanks, the, we're talking about thou- thousands of thousands of years of history. Yeah. 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 Thanks to Hamas, for the first time ever, Gaza witnessed prostitution and hunger. Kids wow. begging on the streets. This was never in Gaza. Gazans, you need to understand. Most Gazans, um, most Gazans, the native Gazans are the minority in Gaza, because most Gazans are refugees who came from other sides of Israel in 1948, and uh, those people are, you know, the the Gazan identity is very, very proud. They're very, very proud, very arrogant, if I may say and mm-hmm. rather, you know, uh, standoffish. So for them to beg for food and stuff like that is like really, really out of character. So it is what it is. We need to call things by their own name. People protesting on the streets for for Gaza, uh, none of them realize what's going on. Uh, they don't actually understand what's happening on, on the ground. Um, people trying to indict uh, the Israeli uh, leadership for war crimes. Uh, none of this is by coincidence. ICC uh, is very politicized, and ICC is connected. It's not hatred of Jews. You need to be clear about what's happening. Mm-hmm. This whole push to save Hamas is not derived by the hatred for Jews. Hatred so it's not Jews. it's not anti-Semitism you're saying. It's not, no no it is it's worse. We, I wish it was only hating Jews. Mm-hmm. It's much worse than that. So so what is it? It's, Jews is a hating Jews is a given. I hate to say this, in the European culture there has been Western European culture there has been an established characteristic trait of that culture of hating Jews and blaming Jews for everything. Mm-hmm. One credit I would give to Hitler is he was honest about his views. You know, the, the, yeah. the, the now anti-Semitism is harder to trace and mm-hmm. actually takes a very dangerous twist of oh, it's supporting human rights. So, yes, it's driven by hating Jews, but it's more than that. It's way more than hating Jews. Who's driving the anti-Israel protest? Who's driving those globalist organizations to demonize Israel amidst this war? Globalist organizations. Mm-hmm. The globalist establishment. Who is the globalist establishment? If, you know, Trump spoke about him several times. He spoke about him at the White House, at the United Nations. Yeah. yeah. The globalist establishment are the people who have benefited very, very well in World War II because of the war and who have kept the assets and command on everything since then. They're mm-hmm. not a cult. They're not a Freemasonry uh, union. 
They're not anything like that. They are big, well-connected, wealthy people who have done very well under the status quo. And they've created a new term, uh, they, which they began using since Bush Sr. Uh, recognized a so-called new world order, a globalist system. Globalist system where the elite are able to create chaos, war, and trouble. And no better tool than creating war and trouble than fueling Islamism. You need to accept that Islam, my religion, my beloved mm-hmm. religion, has been used to bring chaos and disorder across the world after yeah. after the Soviet Union collapsed. Okay. So, yeah. Now, do so, you think- so this. So then this leads, leads me to what I've tried to explain to some people in private conversation, and and actually, I don't. I'm not even sure if I've ever said this publicly, but. I pointed out that the October 7th attack was heavily influenced by Russia. Now, I'll stand corrected if you say if you think otherwise, but this sounds exactly in the direction of what you're saying and it's but it's also based off of this globalist agenda and uh is that correct at all? No, not Russia at all. No. Not even close. The, uh, okay, I'll try and make this simple. <laughs> okay. Most people look at what politicians do and they claim that politicians are stupid. Politicians, in most cases, have gone to schools better than most of us have gone to. And they have access to information, which we don't. They are smart people. That's why they control you, because they're smarter than the rest of us, more informed than the rest of us. They're not stupid. Mm -hmm. People call them that they are, I'm sorry for using that term, cuckolds. No, they're not. They know exactly what they're doing. They've been supporting and propping up radical Islam. Mm-hmm. That's why Western capitals like Belgium, uh, Germany, and elsewhere, they have, and including Washington, D.C., they have welcomed Islamists with open arms. Mm-hmm. They've used Islamists, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood group, right. to create all terror groups we know of. Those terror groups are... Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, the leader, the founding father of Al-Qaeda is a Jordanian, Sheikh Abdullah Azam, Professor Abdullah Azam. He's the mentor of Osama bin Laden. He was basically trained and propped up by the Jordanian intelligence. Jordanian intelligence that the government of Jordan would never do that without an okay from the higher ups in Western capitals. Mm-hmm. Um, Hamas. Hamas was the brainchild of Bush Sr. when he was vice president of the United States. It was created under the watch of the US administration at the time. And it was created, we have enough evidence that it was created in full cooperation and training, received training from the Jordanian intelligence in 1987. We have the information. We need a few few episodes to to explain and present the evidence. Hamas is, Hamas, according to the hierarchy, is the Palestine chapter, and I'm quoting, the Palestine chapter of Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood. Who mm-hmm. controls Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood? The King of Jordan controls Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood. You know, those this stooge and silly, you know, fakaktas uh, from U.S. experts and think tanks, they claim that the king is threatened by Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood. The king is well connected to Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood. The king, according to his own words, and I can happily give you the references if you wish, and if anyone wishes to to look those up, 
The king himself said, quote unquote, the Muslim Brotherhood is a part of my regime. And I've run, I've published many articles with the American thinker uh, blog explaining the king's connection to the Muslim Brotherhood and how they work together. Therefore, mm-hmm. the biggest question, this is how it goes. Hamas would have never pulled what they did on the 7th of October without a go-ahead from their master group, which is Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood. And Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood would never, ever pull that one off without a go-ahead from Jordan's king. And Jordan's king would never pull that one off without a go-ahead from someone much bigger than he is. I know who that person is. I know who that government is. But Mm -hmm. I'm not at liberty to talk about it at the moment. But it's not the United States, absolutely not the United States. And things have changed in Washington. The Islamists are no longer welcome. People would Mm -hmm. wonder about what Biden, President Biden is saying and doing. It's fine, okay, it's it's called politics. It's the way it's done. Love, like it or not, hate hate the game, not the player. But the Islamists are no longer the sweetheart of the U.S. establishment. The U.S. establishment is no longer interested in the in supporting and propping up the Islamists. This is the only reason how Israel is go, allowed to go after Hamas. Have you not noticed in the past, you would always, you know, Hamas would do some stupid stuff and you would go after Hamas for two months, four months, but you're never allowed to destroy Hamas. Suddenly yeah. Israel is pushed back when you could have destroyed Hamas. This Correct. time is happening. This time you're going all the way. Something has changed. And let me explain from a strategic point of view who you are dealing with. In the old days, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the U.S. had no enemy. You need to know that there is the patriotic forces within the U.S. Those patriotic forces were presented by a lot of patriots in in both houses, Senate and Congress. Patriots from both parties. Democrats and Republicans, never mind the proportion there. And they want to end the conflicts. They want a prosperous America, a great America, not necessarily Trump's vision of a great America, but they they are patriots and they are the globalist corrupts. Now, after the Soviet Union collapsed, U.S. was left with no enemies. And the U.S. had to invent one, and that was Islamism. So they propped up Islamist movements into the core. When Trump accused Hillary Clinton of creating ISIS with Obama, he wasn't kidding. Absolutely wasn't. The evidence is all over the place, and Jordan's King involvement is documented. It's not even a theory. It's documented by mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Now, the U.S. today, so that time, the period, they gave them 25 years where they were looking for an enemy and they could afford it to mess with everyone and everything. Now the U.S. was caught off guard. The U.S. has a real enemy, a very threatening enemy. And I really wish for the audience to pay attention to this one because it connects immediately to what's happening in Gaza. The real enemy is China. 100%. China is, I'm not against China. I'm absolutely not against the Chinese government. I'm telling you how the U.S. views the Chinese government at the moment. China is a very big country, huge, with incredible money, yeah. cash to burn, endless human capital. They can get as many soldiers as they want, and they don't have the democratic agencies which would stop decision makers from making difficult decisions about war. And at Mm. the same time, the Chinese government and Chinese establishment is all over the place. The Chinese are in Egypt. The Chinese are in Israel. You remember, and this is difficult for some people to listen, do you remember when Israeli high-techs would sell for millions for nothing. Like, I know this kid, he lived in his parents' 
a spare room in his parents' house somewhere near Jerusalem. And he creates an app eight years ago, a, a, an app good for nothing. Chinese investors buy it for $3 million. They were buying Israel left and right. They wanted to, the way Chinese do it is they're business people, you know. If the U.S. Yeah. is interested in politics, the Chinese are interested in business. That's why yeah. they're more welcomed by most countries. So suddenly, suddenly the U.S. found itself off guard, and it's very likely that the U.S. is in a collision course with China. Mm -hmm. Therefore, U.S. has to end the, the stupid wreck all over the Middle East and elsewhere. U.S. cannot afford the entertainment of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which the U.S. establishment has been fueling and propping up for the past 60, 70 years, minimum. Mm -hmm. It's a sideshow which the U.S. establishment has capitalized on and turned it into a major show. And now they realize they need both Israelis and Arabs happy in order to God forbid, someday they had to face China. Now, the Israelis are pissed off at, at the United States. The Arabs are pissed off at the United States. They think it's the enemy. With right. what Bush did in Iraq, you know, toppling the whole government for nothing. Empower yeah. Iran, U.S. and Iran, they have a very special relationship. So the Sunni Arab Muslim majority, I think of them, are enemies. And the Israelis don't like them. So could the U.S. afford to go to war, God forbid, with China 10, 15 years away from now, with, with the Middle East fully hateful of the United States? Why would we support them? Why would you agree to send Israeli soldiers to fight with them? Why mm -hmm. would you allow is, uh, Jordanian and Palestinian soldiers in the future to go fight China or at least support and die for, for U.S. interest in the region. Let's yeah. not forget China, you know, because of the way the Egyptian government has been pushed away by the United States under Obama. President Sisi has jumped right into the Chinese lab. And he, he what have you now? You have the Suez Canal fully under China's control. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. has awakened to the problem, to the predicament it's found itself in. And how does this connect to you and I, draw, draw, draw? Yeah. It connects to you and I that the U.S. for the first time wants the Israeli-Arab conflict solved at any cost. At any cost. That's why you didn't hear about crap like the peace process. What mm -hmm. they need to do, and I'm telling you what's going to happen next. And quote my words, hold me, hold me accountable for this. One, we're going to get rid of Hamas. Then, next in line will be the Muslim Brotherhood in the region. The HQ of the Muslim Brotherhood in the region is in Jordan. Jordan hosts the global HQ of the world's Muslim Brotherhood. And I've made a lot of documentation with evidence of that. Hmm. Sheikh Hamam Saeed, a Jordanian, is the controller of the Muslim Brotherhood across the world. When Erdogan became prime minister a 19 years ago, the first thing he did was travel to Jordan, meet Sheikh Hamam Saeed and the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, then meet with the King of Jordan. And the King of Jordan is designated as the godfather or number zero. They call him number zero. For the Muslim Brotherhood. It's like Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood to the king is like the ruling party for uh, for Netanyahu, like the Likud for Netanyahu, or the Chinese Communist Party party for President Shea. If the King of Jordan falls, Muslim Brotherhood goes down the drain. If the Muslim Brotherhood falls, the king is no more. The joint at the hip. And I tell you, that's why the king is going like running around like a headless chicken. That's why his wife made five interviews saying the most hurtful anti-Semitic words, claiming Israel is involved in ge genocide, claiming Israel is a pariah state, even ridiculing those 
who claim that anti-Semitism exists. She said, no, it's criticized in Israel. It's not that. So this woman, to have the chutzpah, to say that yeah. right on U.S. television, she and her husband are going crazy because they know what's next. What's next is doing away with the Muslim Brotherhood, and that means doing away with the Hashemite regime because it's going to follow. And then after that, it's going to be Hezbollah. This is yeah. how it's going to go. I am an, an ex-fighter pilot. You know, you don't pay as much attention to time. Time is critical, of its essence, but you would be more concerned by procedures. When you're a pilot, you cannot do one procedure before the other. Even if it's the right procedure, you have to do do things in order, in a chronological manner, one step after another. And even when you retract, when you land the airplane, again, it's reversing what you've been doing one step after another. So I'm more focused on technical procedures rather than when. And therefore, I don't discuss time. But what I can assure you is this is how it's going to go. Hezbollah after Jordan, Jordan after Hamas. And it's not because anyone has anything against the king of Jordan. He's a nobody. He doesn't make a difference. The problem is with the snake, the snake he's hosting in his place. The snake he's become, you know, joined at the hip to. Hmm. Now, after that, we're going to look at a whole different scenario for the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, which will include a change of situation where a, the majority in Jordan will be ruled by, would definitely elect a Palestinian uh, ruler because, and that's a game changer. It's very mm -hmm. unfortunate how some of your so-called friends stood against you at the time. I think you saw how uh, United Arab Emirates Ron was has been leading, leading the fight to recognize a Palestinian state in the United Nations. And it shows that back to the basics. How can you, you know, do you remember when Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and so-called peace advisor, I'm not sure if that was his title, created the Abrahamic Accord? Yeah, they were just of a very lame diversion from what Israel should have done and could have done, which is annexing the West Bank. Palestinians right. in the West Bank would welcome an Israeli annexation. Yes, hmm. they hate Jews. Yes, they think this is their land, but they would rather get Israeli benefits. Israeli, right. you know, I, I could talk about it for, for hours. What stopped that? U.S. administration pressured Netanyahu not to do it, talked him out of it, pushed him. And, you know, there was the United Arab Emirates making a statement that, oh, please don't annex the West Bank because if you annex it, we won't be able to sign peace. And you got the Abrahamic Accords. The Abrahamic Accords, in theory, are beautiful, but they're not in, worth. In theory, in theory, <laughs> not worth the paper they're written on. The wow. United Arab Emirates criticized, voted against you in the UN several times for the benefit of the Palestinian Authority, and I can give you the track record. United mm -hmm. Arab Emirates has pushed very hard for recognition of the Palestinian state. Top advisors to the ruler of the United Arab Emirates, and I happily give you names and guide them to Twitter in a country like the United Arab Emirates, where you cannot say anything, anything without you out of the line, the general line of the government. They've been speaking very ill of Israel. I'm not against the United Arab Emirates. I love the United Arab Emirates. I love Dubai. At the same time, facts first. You cannot have peace with country, Arab countries very, very far away before you can have peace in Jerusalem. What use is peace with Dubai or peace with Abu Dhabi or peace with Morocco or even Sudan or even Bahrain if you cannot have calm at home in Jerusalem? And the only way to have calm at home in Jerusalem is for the Palestinians to have a state. You can't keep them stateless. How do they have a state? Oslo is no way to have a state. Any Palestinian state at the moment, west of the river, is not feasible. Hmm. It will only bring more Israeli dead children and more Israeli raped women, like we saw. So we need some practical solution that actually works. 
The practical solution is liberating 78% of Palestine, which is Jordan, and allowing the 97% majority, again, I repeat, 97.3% majority to rule itself in Jordan. The Palestinian Arabs in the Nashtachim or the West Bank have always been citizens of Jordan. You, Ron, most Israelis, all Israelis would never support ethnic cleansing of the Arabs from uh, the territories of the West, Judea and Samaria. But those Arabs, they want a state, they want a parliament, they want a place they can call home. They have a state called Jordan. Hmm. The Jordanian government should restore the citizenship it took away from all Palestinians in the Nashtachim illegally against international law and against Jordanian law. We have when did a, when did they do this? When exactly was it that? 1988, after mm -hmm. having collected taxes from the Palestinians for close to 60 years. Okay, actually, uh, yeah, yeah, in, uh, yeah. Exactly after they have collected taxes from the Jordanians for 40 years, we've paid their taxes. There was nothing in the Hashemite kingdom. They had no money. I'm an academic. I'm, my specialty is the Arab-Israeli conflict. They, they had nothing. They We built Jordan from nothing with the help of our brothers, the native Jordanians, the East Bankers, who, by mm -hmm. the way, hold no hostility to us, no hostility towards Israel either. At the mm -hmm. same time, they took our taxes and they just dropped us the way you would drop, you know, a used towel, paper towel, throw it into the trash and took away our citizenship. 1988. How can you do that? It's against the law to make people stateless. It's against mm -hmm. the Jordanian law. There's even more than that. Jordanian Citizenship Act, Article 2, 1952, states that any Palestinian, born Palestinian, who is not Jewish is an automatic citizen of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. So we need to set the record straight. We need to call the things by their own name. I live in London. Do you realize how many Europeans reside in London without having a, a passport? I I grew up in New Hampshire, USA, and in northern New Hampshire, we had a lot of Canards, Canadians. Living, working in New Hampshire and traveling over the weekend to Quebec. They mm. never claimed citizenship in the United States. They never claimed anything more than residency in New Hampshire, and they didn't want their own parliament. There was a parliament in Ottawa, Canada, to which they could have voted. Without this solution, there will never be a solution. You could, mm. And again, let me remember people like, for example, Daniel Pipes. A very, very, you know, very impressive scholar, very formidable scholar, Jewish American. He always, him and others, advocated the words keeping the status quo. Well, we saw where the status quo went on the 7th of October. The status yeah. quo is unsustainable, unfair, and trust me, it's not fun for the Israelis. The Israelis do not enjoy setting checkpoints in the Nashtachim. The Israelis yeah. do not enjoy arguing with Palestinians over the Temple Mount. The Israeli soldiers would rather drink a beer and watch a movie rather than fighting with Israel with Palestinians all over the place. It's not one hundred percent. And I'm not, an Israeli soldier, and I can tell you that by yeah, talking to fellow yeah. soldiers yeah. who have served in Judea Samaria at the checkpoints, and one of the toughest positions in the military, actually if you're a combat soldier, is to be at one of those checkpoints, not fighting terrorists, not, you know, it's the psychological frustrations of, like you just said, like who wants to deal with arguing with people on the daily and that those people who are also miserable with the situation want to make your life miserable because they see you as the enemy because you're the one who's standing between them and their goal, which is simply to work in Israel, right? And so you're that obstacle, so to speak, and then you become the one who, who gets the brunt of their frustration and, and, and vice versa. You're the brunt, you know, uh, of theirs. So it's back and forth. Nobody enjoys that. 100%. Israel doesn't want that. 
And the Israelis, I can authoritatively say, and I will say it in both Arabic and English, Israelis, the average Israeli, doesn't bear any form of he hatred towards the Palestinian Arabs or Arabs in general. Israeli al-Atiyadi, shakhs al-Israeli al-Adi, ana astati' an atakallam bi kul diqqa, la yahmil ay nu' min al-karahiya, tijah al-Filistinian al-Arab aw al-Arab umuman. That said, we need a new chapter. You need to accept some fools from both sides. They mistake the proxy war into a genuine conflict. Hmm. Both are victims. The Palestinian being asked for his ID at the checkpoint and the Israelis holding an M16 rifle. Both are victims. Both are clowns acting in a very bad, dark comedy orchestrated by the higher ups who hate both yeah. Arabs and Jews. Yeah. We need a way out, and this I can promise. Uh, the light is upon us for a new chapter in our history. And I can assure you, as the future leader of Jordan, as the current leader of Jordan's majority, there will be a new chapter. There will be a new light. And for the first time, we will be what we were supposed to be prior to 1929, prior to the Mufti igniting the war and the massacres in Hebron, which came out of nowhere. Hmm. This conflict is short of 100 years old between both of us. Now it's time for us to bury it. It's time for us to melt some weapons and start creating shovels to build and do our farming with it. Expect the unexpected in the foreseen future. Things will change. And inshallah, and I'm saying this both in Arabic and English, because my people need to listen, that we will be welcoming our Palestinian Jews in Jordan. We will be allowing Jews to make Aliyah to Jordan, and they will once they see the country safe. We will welcome the first synagogue in Jordan. I will pray Islamically in the first synagogue in Jordan. And I'm telling everyone in advance, for me, as Muda Zaran, the difference between Palestinian Jordanians and Jews slash Israelis is asking me to make a difference, ask me to choose a favorite, is exactly like asking me to choose a favorite of one of my eyes, one eye over another, I want both my eyes intact, and I want them both healthy and safe. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Peace, shalom, love for everyone. And may the hands of God save the children in Gaza, save Israeli children, and save the Israeli soldiers fighting in Gaza. It's the same God who saved Am Israel and Moses, the same God who saved Muhammad from the uh, infidels, idol worshippers chasing him into Medina. It's the same God. He's done it once. He can do it again. All the pharaohs of the region, I am already telling you, you will meet Pharaoh's fate in the foreseen future for the amount of blood you have shed, for the amount of support you provided for the terrorists, for the amount of hatred you inflicted upon Jews who've done nothing to you, and also for the amount of demonization and, and abuse you've given to the Palestinians at your own hand. This is our time. Mark my words. Thanks for having me, Mom. No, well, Mudar, I really appreciate that, brother. This has been a great interview. I appreciate all the insights that you brought to the audience. Uh, I think it's been important. We've had different people on this uh, podcast. Christian, uh, Druze, and now you. Um, and that's the idea, is to give people the insights from people who live here, their real experience versus the uh, media portrayal of how things are here. Mudar, I really appreciate your time. And I know that the people listening have uh, got a lot of good information from you today. And may you be blessed, my brother, and thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Israel Chai, Ummat Israel Hayya. I'm Israel Chai, I'm Yordan Chai, Ummat Israel Hayya, Ummat Al-Urdun wa Palestine Hayya. Assalamu alaikum.
Awesome, brother. Appreciate that.